this is Miss Katie Gordon, and she is program manager at the Kaufman Inst um, Interfaith Institute, and she's a recent graduate of Alma College. And each week, she publishes the online newsletter Interfaith Inform, a journal of religious activities in Western Michigan. The Interfaith Dialogue Association, which she is part of, works together to advance understanding of religions and ideologies by study, dialogue, and sharing about religious experiences. To eliminate prejudices between members of different religious traditions and ideologies, to foster an appreciation for the richness of diverse religions and ideologies, to identify commonalities and differences among religions and ideologies to enhance personal growth and transformation, and to, and to promote friendship and trust among people of diverse religions and ideologies. Thanks. So this week, um, you guys have an ongoing diversity fair, right? And today's theme is religion. And what I'm talking about today, pluralism, is kind of where the two diversity and religion overline. Because what pluralism actually means is engaging diversity in a meaningful way. And that's what interfaith is, is talking about our differences, embracing differences between identities, and using that to have a meaningful conversation and actually, you know, acting upon that, doing something together. Um, and I am only going to try to talk for a short bit. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand or anything. Um, so just so I can get a feel for the room, what year are you guys generally? Freshmen and sophomores? OK, very cool. Um, so a little bit more background on me. Um, I'm from Muskegon originally, so not too far from here. And I went to college um, at Elma College. I graduated last year, and I've been working in Grand Rapids at Grand Valley State University at the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. Um, and there we just do community programming and campus programming um, at Grand Valley to promote uh, you know, events or um, dialogues between the different religious communities. And um, it's a really, I think it's a really fun thing. I don't know how much you guys have uh, heard about interfaith before, but really you're just building relationships with people who either are pretty similar to you, come from the same religious background, or are very different from you, and you can learn a lot from them just in the differences and see some other perspectives on how they live their life in a meaningful way. Um, so let's see, do a few more. So the Kaufman Interfaith Institute is in Grand Rapids. The Interfaith Youth Corps is kind of the national perspective of what interfaith is. Um, and the Interfaith Youth Corps works with college age students and used to work with high school age students. Um, and then even President Obama has actually done a lot with interfaith service over the last few years with something called the President's Interfaith and Community Service Challenge. And the Better Together program is a national initiative by the Interfaith Youth Corps. So first, I want to show you a video that went viral, at least in my little interfaith world, uh, last week. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. About, about, about to say, yeah. Sunshine, just here, you can take a break. Take, take, take a break. I'm a hot air balloon. Come along if you feel like a room without a room Because I'm happy Come along if you feel that happiness is the truth Because I'm happy Come along if you know what happiness is to you Because I'm happy Come along if you feel like that's what you want to do That's what you want to do Okay I'll just leave it there. So that video was started by, or um, was created by an organization in the UK. And this is the quote from why they made the video. They said, this is what we want to be about, a national community coming together for each other's sake, each individual giving a bit of their time for the greater good. So do you guys have any guesses on what the greater good is in that video? I think this one's a little harder to pick up on than most interfaith things. But what's sort of the value that they want to promote? It's kind of the song. Yeah, happiness. Um, 
Well, I think they're recognizing that happiness and that kind of like joy is really root to the Islamic faith, but also any faith. And, and the greater good that they're promoting by doing that video and showing it online is that that's not the usual image you get of Islam in the media, right? Like when you hear the word Muslim or you hear something in like the international media or news that's going on, it's usually pretty negatively portrayed. And that's a very small portion of actually the Muslim community. Um, the Muslim community is just like us. They dance around to Pharrell because Pharrell makes great music. So I think that's what interfaith is really about, is promoting those, those values of understanding between communities. So now we'll get into what interfaith actually means. Um, so interfaith is just the start. Um, it's more of a prefix, I think, than anything else, because literally interfaith just means faiths interacting. It's pretty straightforward. Um, but the goal of what interfaith is makes it what it, what it means today. So I'll give a few examples. You guys probably have seen the coexist stickers, right, on bumper cars. I don't know if any of you drive yet. Um, that's what the coexist sticker is. So coexistence and tolerance are kind of the first steps of what interfaith could be. Um, it's basically saying that I will coexist among people who believe different things than me. So this first symbol is um, the crescent from the Muslim faith. And then there's a peace sign, uh, the gender symbols, the Star of David for Judaism, a pagan symbol, a uh, Taoist symbol, and then the Christian cross. So that's saying we'll tolerate each other, basically. And then the next step would be dialogue and understanding. So the goal here is to come to an understanding and appreciate people from a different background than your own. And this picture is a student group at Grand Valley State University. And every year for the last few years, um, Hillel, which is the Jewish student group, have hosted a dinner um, that honors one of their former leaders in the Jewish faith. And two years ago, they invited the Muslim Student Association to join them and share a meal. And they talked about you know, what similarities they have and what differences they have. And this year, a Christian group joined them for the dinner. So that's the dialogue and understanding. Another example is, this is also in Grand Rapids. Um, these are three women, one from the Christian tradition, one from Muslim, and one from Jewish. And they have a group of six couples, um, two from each of those Abrahamic faiths. And uh, they just get together and have dinner and hang out once a month and get to know each other. And this has been going on for years. And talking is great. I really like talking to people and learning from them. But I think it's kind of boring. It doesn't really produce much actual concrete action. So that's where the next step comes in, which is service and cooperation. So it's actually, you know, using these values that each of your traditions has and coming together and doing something. So here's um, a quote from Martin Luther King. It says, we are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. And then another uh, inspiration for doing interfaith service is from the folk singer, Pete Seeger. And he says, participation, that's what's going to save the human race. So what this looks like um, is different around the country, but there are thousands of campuses that participate in interfaith service. And this is in Grand Rapids at Masjid at Taweed, which is not too far from here. It's um, the mosque out on East Paris. And every year, well, they have a food pantry in their basement, actually, that gives food to um, everyone in the community. You don't have to be Muslim to receive the food from the food pantry. Um, so this is kind of their service to the community. And they, all, every year, they welcome anyone to come help sort the food pantry. So this is a group when I went to Elma College we brought a group to the food pantry to help sort everything and learn more about um, the Muslim faith. And um, interfaith is more of a movement around the whole world too and in, in the country. So this is an example somewhere, uh, a state in the US somewhere, 
um, where there was a Muslim soccer player and she was told that she couldn't wear her hijab. And you know, the hijab is central to her faith and how she, how she represents her faith. So, you know, she was really hurt that she couldn't wear her hijab, that, you know, the coach wasn't accepting of that, even though FIFA did allow it. So what her teammates did was, you know, decided to all wear a hijab as well. And so this act of solidarity, um, the coach ended up letting them play, even though they all had hijabs on. And so, you know, standing alongside people who are being discriminated against is one way of living out interfaith values. Oh, uh, this picture is from the Arab Spring. So in Egypt, um, you can see in the middle there that there are some Muslims praying, um, one of the five prayers throughout the day. And since it was a really dangerous zone, uh, Christians uh, encircled all of them to protect them while they prayed. And Muslims have done the same for Christians. This is in Pakistan where there was um, a church and they wanted to protect it during the service. And interfaith has been present throughout history, too, though not explicitly. Um, so Martin Luther King was one interfaith leader. He was really inspired by Gandhi, who was Hindu. And Martin Luther King was Christian, a Christian pastor. And then Gandhi was very inspired by Jesus. So a lot of the values, you know, uh, cross the religious divides. Okay. So now there, I just want to kind of get out of the way some myths that are often um, thought of with interfaith. So the first one is that um, people often think that if you're doing interfaith, then you have to water down your own faith and make it very simplistic for others to understand. But that's not true. Um, you know, you can come to the table fully yourself, um, your identity or your lack of religious identity, and you know, engaging in these conversations with other people won't necessarily make you question your own. It just helps you reaffirm your own identity and strengthen it. Another common misconception is that interfaith assumes that everyone should agree about everything and that it's a really fluffy way of getting together and, you know, just sing in a circle and sing kumbaya or something like that. But that's not true either because in interfaith, you recognize the, the uniqueness and distinctions between the religions, and that's kind of the point, is to come to understand that there are these differences, and that's totally okay. And uh, that doesn't mean that we can't come together and work together on these you know, big, big social issues in our world. And then the last one that I have is that interfaith only matters to people who fit neatly in one box or another. And that's also not true. Um, I mean, the whole point is that everyone, like no matter of your tradition, your lack of tradition, if you believe in God or no God or gods, everyone is welcome at the table and has a part in the conversation and has a stake in the conversation. Um, this isn't just for, you know, minority faiths who are discriminated against. The majority faiths also have to be an active part in interfaith because they're the ones who can kind of help bring minority traditions more um, respect in the community. Okay, so this is my favorite guy when it comes to interfaith. I'm going to play what he said um, on a This I Believe statement a few years ago, well, 2005, um, but this is his own, there's an introduction to Ibu Patel, and this is his own story of where his inspiration comes from to do interfaith work. Curator, independent producer, Jay Allison. Ibu Patel's beliefs were confirmed in a moment he's not proud of. His efforts since then have been to redeem that moment by honoring what he believes in with action. Here is Ibu Patel with his essay for This I Believe, which begins, as he says, the way Muslims begin most things, with a prayer. It translates, in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I am an American Muslim. I believe in pluralism. In the Holy Quran, God tells us, I created you into diverse nations and tribes that you may come to know one another. I believe America is humanity's best opportunity 
to make God's wish that we come to know one another a reality. In my office hangs Norman Rockwell's illustration, Freedom of Worship. A Muslim holding a Quran stands near a Catholic woman fingering her rosary. Other characters have their hands folded in prayer and their eyes filled with piety. They stand shoulder to shoulder, facing the same direction, comfortable with the presence of one another, and yet apart. It is a vivid depiction of a group living in peace with its diversity, yet not exploring it. We live in a world where the forces that seek to divide us are strong. To overcome them, we must do more than simply stand next to one another in silence. I attended high school in the western suburbs of Chicago. The group I ate lunch with included a Jew, a Mormon, a Hindu, a Catholic, and a Lutheran. We were all devout to a degree, but we almost never talked about religion. Somebody would announce at the table that they couldn't eat a certain kind of food or any food at all for a period of time. We all knew religion hovered behind this, but nobody ever offered any explanation deeper than my mom said, and nobody ever asked for one. A few years after we graduated, my Jewish friend from the lunchroom reminded me of an experience we both wish had never happened. A group of thugs in our high school had taken to scrawling anti-Semitic slurs on classroom desks and shouting them in the hallway. I did not confront them. I did not comfort my Jewish friend. Instead, I averted my eyes from their bigotry, and I avoided the eyes of my friend because I couldn't stand to face him. My friend told me he feared coming to school those days, and he felt abandoned as he watched his close friends do nothing. Hearing him tell me of his suffering and my complicity is the single most humiliating experience of my life. My friend needed more than my silent presence at the lunch table. I realize now that to believe in pluralism means I need the courage to act on it. Action is what separates a belief from an opinion. Beliefs are imprinted through actions. In the words of the American poet Gwendolyn Brooks, we are each other's business, we are each other's harvest, we are each other's magnitude and bond. I cannot go back in time and take away the suffering of my Jewish friend, but through action I can prevent it from happening to others. Ibu Patel with Okay, so he is one of the, I think, big interfaith leaders in the country today in the U.S. Um, are there any certain quotes that you guys kind of really stuck out to you? Anything that he said? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, especially at a, a young age, at any point in your life, it can be really hard to um, to stand up, especially if you're not the one explicitly being attacked. But if you, if someone's standing next to you, shoulder to shoulder, like he says, is then you know what's your role in that situation. Yeah. Mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah, the difference between belief and opinion is something that Ibu is really big about. Um, because, you know, the, the interfaith youth core, they really like interfaith dialogue. They really like, you know, bridging those divides. But where the meaning comes in is acting together. So you voice, you engage, and you act. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, that's, that's really true is, um, you know, you don't want to step on anyone's toes. You don't want to offend anyone, especially when it comes to something like religion that's really core to your identity. Um, what I really like that he said in that lunchroom scene is, you know, a lot of what they understood themselves was just things that their moms told them. So they didn't have, you know, a very um, intimate understanding of what their identities mean in their daily lives. So I think, you know, having that conversation, it's kind of like a tricky thing to get over. Like, just making the first step and asking like, hey, like, 
you do this or you wear this, why is that? Um, but once you do do that, it can be a really, really cool conversation that I think um, a lot of people should be having, especially with religion, which is so core to who you are. Does anyone else have one? What I really liked about that is um, what he said that, you know, the forces that seek to divide us today are strong. Um, you know, we don't talk about religion very much. It's kind of a taboo sometimes to talk about religion, but that's because religion is often perceived as, you know, a tool for violence or war because that's what we see in the media. But that's not true. And, you know, Ibu's point and a lot of what the interfaith movement is about is that religion can be used as a force for good or coming together in unity. Um, and so through exploring it, like Ibu says, I think we could, you know, get to that point, and that's what, that's what interfaith does. So now I kind of want to explore why interfaith matters in our community, in Forest Hills, in Grand Rapids, in West Michigan, um, I don't think we have the same religious problems that a lot of the rest of the world has, but what are your ideas on why something like interfaith could matter in this high school, in this community, anywhere? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, your school, or Grand Rapids really, um, doesn't seem to be as diverse as some other communities, um, which doesn't make it any less important to talk about diversity because you know, you'll all be moving to a bigger university or school somewhere in the country, somewhere in the state, which will have more diversity. So I think you know, the earlier you learn about how to interact with that and how to engage it, the better. Any other ideas? Mm hmm Yeah. Definitely. It's a good segue into the diversity in Grand Rapids. Um, so while, you know, it doesn't seem like our community is diverse, maybe in Forest Hills um, or at this high school, um, if you look at the broader Grand Rapids community, um, a lot of religions have little pockets here and there um, where they're really active. So we have over 8,000 Muslims. This is stats from two or three years ago. Over 8,000 Muslims, over 800 Jews, over 2,000 Hindus, and over 500 Buddhists, and over 200 Sikhs, six, um, which are of the Sikh faith, another uh, Indian religion. So this diversity does exist in our community, but you have to kind of, it's not that you have to go seek it, but you have to be able to recognize it and see, see what's there. And, you know, these religions, these faith communities are our neighbors, literally in Grand Rapids. Um, like I said, the mosque or Masjid at Taweed um, is on East Paris. And right next to them is another mosque, which is of the uh, kind of Bosnian Muslim tradition. Here are just a couple photos that I liked. This is at the West Michigan Hindu Temple. Fred Stella from the Hindu Temple is gonna be here later today. And he's the president of the Interfaith Dialogue Association. And this photo on the right is at the Sikh Gudwara, which is out in Ada, also not too far from here, I don't think. Um, and these two communities are actually, you know, less than a mile apart from each other and they both have really beautiful temples, really active community members. Um, the Sikh Gudwara, uh, you could recognize them by the turbans that they wear, the men wear in the community. Um, so the two individuals on the right, they're Sikh, um, and then the rest of us were visiting. But, you know, a lot of the Sikh individuals are doctors in the community, and a lot of the people who are at the Hindu temple are engineers and scientists. And I have one more video for you after this. Um, another reason why interfaith really matters for us 
as we're going into, you know, um, this diverse world where the U.S. is one of the most religiously diverse uh, countries in the world, um, is that religious violence, while it's not the norm and it's not what religion is always about, unfortunately, in some communities or with some individuals, they do use religion as an excuse for violence. Um, just a couple weeks ago, there was a shooting at a Jewish community down in Kansas City, and three people were killed. They were actually Christian. So that was, uh, I mean, it's unfortunate whenever anyone gets killed, but um, someone from a former KKK clan, you know, went to a Jewish community to try to, uh, with his kind of Nazi ideals, um, kill Jewish people. And then two years ago, there was a shooting at a Sikh Gurdwara in Wisconsin where I think dozens of people died. Okay. And I just saw this video last week. I thought it was really powerful. Um, these two girls, one Muslim, one Jewish, you know, recognize that they're from a really tumultuous region, they're from the Middle East, or their, their identities, their cultures are from the Middle East, from Israel and Palestine. And they are tired of people using that division as an excuse for violence. So, this is what they said. We're just a little too caught up in the way the world sees us, and the way my people see yours, and the way my people see yours, and the way our people see ourselves. 1996, a Jewish girl was born with the Shabbat candles glistening in her eyes. 1996, a Muslim girl was born with the Aydana ringing in her ears. She only knew of her own, of Jumrah, Kabbalah Shabbat, Nashib, Zmirot, Allah, Adonai. She never noticed that Muslim girl holding the same needles and threads that she did. So we quilted generations from stitches and callous palms of their past. Yes. Friday prayers, religious songs, like God. We are both birthed from resilience, yet raised by assumptions. This Jewish girl, Muslim girl, only heard dirty money, oppressive husband, big nose banker, suspicious terrorist, gas chamber, go back home. But, but, but it's 2013, right? So all that's done, right? So why is it that every time a penny falls, I'm assumed to be the one to pick it up, stealing from every man's pocket, and every time an airport security check line moves forward, I'm the one who's pulled aside and patted down. We both look discrimination in the eye. We both live in a country that swears up and down that all people are equal. Our hands should be caught together, fists raised as one, fighting against the stereotype that this country has put upon my people. In Hebron, a 14-year-old Palestinian girl was killed when a Jewish settler shot a bullet into her right eye. She'll never get to witness her holy land come back to her. Mm. In Herzliya, a 14-year-old Israeli girl was killed by a Palestinian pipe bomb. She was just trying to eat her dinner at her favorite restaurant by the beach. We are told to stay within the confines of our religion, of our tradition, oh, as if a young Palestinian girl's life ended by Israeli gunfire is worth any more or less than a young Israeli girl's life ended by a Palestinian pipe. Oh, this world would rather chew up and spit out our history than help these two girls. That could have been us. Mm. This world has devoured our past, but how quickly it forgets you are what you eat. You See, this Jewish girl and this Muslim girl are far more similar than our religions would like us to believe because I bet you didn't realize that we have the same favorite movie and that we both love hummus. And we keep being asked the same damn questions every time we fall head over heels. Is he a respectable Muslim boy? Jewish boy? Did you meet him at the mall? That little Palestinian girl and that little Israeli girl will never get to be asked these questions, never get to discover whether they had the same favorite movies, whether they were both going to become poets, performing on stages like this one, and we may not have either, and we let the way the world sees us get in our way. We are connected. We are one. Like Adonai. Like Allah. Like God. So I love that video because I think it shows, you know, these are two 
American girls, really. They live in Chicago, um, so they're not, you know, they're not in the communities that they're talking about. They're not in Israel and Palestine, but the issues go broader than just that region of the world. It's about um, us doing our part in the U.S. to bridge these religious divides and make sure that they are no longer, um, they no longer divide us and that you know you can come together and find out you have the same favorite movies. So, let's see. Okay, so, any, re any reflections on that slam poetry? I don't know if slam poetry is something you guys are into, but um, I thought it was really great. Um, and I just kind of am interested to hear how you think maybe interfaith could benefit your high school or your broader community um, if you see it kind of having a role anywhere. And the other question um, that I have for you guys is, you know, in order to go to, um, to be a part of interfaith, I think you, um, you know, you bring your own perspective to it. And so a lot of people are inspired from their own traditions to like the Christian tradition of loving your neighbor. You know, that, that idea, love thy neighbor, brings a lot of Christians into the interfaith world. Or um, in the Quran, it says that, you know, you, you love all people of the book. And the book is not just the Quran. Uh, the book is also the Torah, Torah of the Jewish faith and the Bible of the Christian faith. So, any comments? Before today, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I think, um, you know, while interfaith has the word faith in it, it really is a broader idea or broader concept. Um, like in my personal life, I started doing interfaith in college, but I was also studying political science at the same time. And so, you know, I, I saw how divided our Congress was on a lot of issues. And I thought, like, you know, they could really use some interfaith because interfaith is about understanding someone who's different than yourself, basically. And it kind of gives you the tools to do that. So, so yeah, I think that interfaith could be kind of a good model just for, for learning, engaging with your community. Any other thoughts? Before today, um, or Diversity Week, had you guys heard of the word interfaith before? So if you have heard about it, where did you hear about it? There were some other students in Grand Rapids at some other high schools, I can't remember which ones, that did, did start an interfaith club um, and actually got to meet Tony Blair um, when he visited Grand Rapids, so that was kind of cool. Um, he's one of the kind of government leaders who's heading up a lot of interfaith efforts. So, yeah, I think um, campuses are kind of the perfect place to start these interfaith conversations. So I'm glad you heard about it. Anyone else hear about interfaith before? Well, now you have 
So you can kind of take these ideas and, I mean, so this is in the context of the other religious presentations today, which I'm not sure if any of you have gotten to see them, but there's a speaker from the Jewish faith, Hindu faith, Muslim faith, Christian faith, and secular tradition, um, talking about their own traditions. And so when you kind of put them all together, that's what interfaith is all about, is about learning about all of these traditions in a spirit of understanding and openness. So, yeah. Um, kind of. Um, I mean, I think, like, like I said, um, you know, King was kind of an interfaith leader in his own way, and before Dr. King, uh, Gandhi took a lot of interfaith ideals, but there's more of a movement of interfaith right now. Um, the guy that we heard from, Ibu Patel, he started the Interfaith Youth Corps in 2005-ish, 2003, and his whole idea, their whole idea is mobilizing the interfaith movement. So it is newer, I think, in the last decade. And it's growing every year um, with more students being really engaged with interfaith and taking it into their own, um, their own careers. So, you know, I happen to work at an interfaith organization, but most of my friends that do interfaith work or kind of, you know, think about interfaith in their, in their lives, um, they're actually in the medical fields or um, becoming clergy in their own churches or synagogues. So it's really not a concept that you have to dedicate your life to. It's just kind of a way that you view others around you. Well, if you want, um, you can ask me questions afterwards. Um, and there's a lot actually going on with Interfaith in Grand Rapids. So if you think it's something that you want to stay in the loop with, um, then I can get your information and we can definitely um, just keep you up to date with what we do. I mean, we actually just uh, finished up a Houses of Worship tour series. So we went to the Gurdwara, we went to a Hindu temple and the masjid and kind of had like a introduction to what the faith is about. So um, just come see me afterwards. And I also have some other cool handouts that illuminate what interfaith means. And it's um, a sheet on shared values. So it takes little excerpts from each of the holy texts. So there are 10 holy texts actually that it includes. And it's all 10 of these faiths view on service, view on alleviating poverty, on forgiveness, and other ideas that you know transcend religious boundaries. So if there aren't any other questions, you can come up to me afterwards and otherwise Thank you for your time.